The European honeybee came to Australia over 180 years ago. It's clear from the news that honeybees are under threat around the world. But feral honeybees are on the rise in the bush and are a great threat to hollow dwelling fauna like black cockatoos and especially our native bees. Australia's rich native flora evolved without honeybees. Our native plants adapted to other pollen vectors like insects, birds and mammals. Especially important are Australia's 2,000 or so species of native bees which are efficient and often specialised pollinators. Without native bees, the risk to our wild bush across Australia is very significant. Frank Shadforth, owner of Seven Emu Pastoral Station, asked the Environment Centre NT to come and have a look at this land. Seven Emu is a superb 800 square mile savannah cattle station within traditional Garawa country on the Gulf of Carpentaria about two hours drive east of Borolula. We travelled to Seven Emu in May 2018. Frank has seen changes on his country over the past 20 years and they are accelerating. He has witnessed a big drop in native bees in Seven Emu and he feels the invasive and aggressive feral honeybees are to blame. Having been born traditionally on the banks of a creek on this land, Frank knows this place intimately. Welcome to Seven Emu Station, a place of great beauty, history and native culture that goes back many, many thousands of years. Yeah, we used to play down here in the sand, because there's one big permanent water of just back here, and we used to play down there, swim in there all day, if you look down there. And there were traditional people living. Yeah, you... both sides of the bank, yeah. all the way down to about a kilometre, and just up around the bend there, that's where I was born, in the creek. Hello, I'm Frank Shadwood, owner of Seven Emu Station. I was born and raised here as a kid. And I grew up and hunted for food in this country. And I've got something to tell you about the bees. I, I think when you're born on a place, you have that connection to it. It's about 888 square mile. I'm bordered by the two beautiful rivers. The one is the Calvert, and the other one is the Robertson. And then you've got the ocean, 50 mile of it. I've walked every part of that land, yeah, yeah hunting for food with my mum, gathering fruits and stuff. What makes it special? Yeah. I think when you're just hunting for food and, you know, there's times you're hungry, but um, if you're walking and hunting for food all your life, see, Indigenous people, they got that way of living on the land for some reason because you're born in the open in nature as it is. You've got that, well, it's more or less like a tree. You've got the roots born into the soil. That's the way I seem to think. Because indigenous people don't like moving. If you look at white uh, European people, they can get on a plane and go and live somewhere else. Indigenous people cannot do that. Yeah. Because they're used to that one section. Yeah. Oh, well, you sort of, you have connection to the trees, the land, the water and everything's around you, you know, the birds, you sort of know when they're talking to you, or you sort of know when the trees are 
having flowers, the insects, and all that sort of stuff. Tell you what fruits are ripening, what birds are around to tell you, tell you what's about. Yeah. What's he telling you? Well, he's telling you there's someone here. <laughs> 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 the cockatoo tell you. You know, if you're sneaking up to a kangaroo to kill a kangaroo, that bird will tell you, tell the kangaroo <laughs> there's an indigenous people there coming with a spear. So the best thing to ever do is try and get to a kangaroo while he's not around. Yeah. Once you start seeing animals that are not, you know, any insect that are not doing the right thing, you know there's a problem somewhere else. Because if you look at the bees and the insect, they all work together. And there's two types of bees. There's a female and a male. And there's a lot of insect that feeds with it. And if you look down the water, there's insect down there. But you don't see them insect no more. A lot of the trees after wet, it should be flowering. And even through the wet, a lot of trees should be flowering. Bats, you know, the flying fox, they come up the river three times a year, pollinating. Now, you don't see that. And what's, what's been happening, the bees not there to pollinate the trees and I showed you a lot of trees that are dying and the flower, you know, the leaves are brownish, it got holes um, and the biggest problem there is the trees are not flowering because it's, to me, the trees are off balance because the uh, European bee has come in and stripped it of its na uh, honey and it also killed the male native bee, the sugar bag we call it. You can see the country is changing very rapidly, yeah. And it's you know, dying. Yeah. See, there's some flowering over there. See there? But there also should be bird on those flowers if there was nectar on them. Let's say you tell if it's good honey. Birds, well, they're not here as much as they should be, like the galahs, the cockatoo, the black cockatoo. Yeah. The white cockatoo. Well, this time of the morning, they should be screeching out. Yeah. You can see straight through them. Yeah. You see these tea trees? Yeah. You see this? We call it mulga tree. That should be flowering. It should be really thick and shady, but you can see there's a lot of dry limbs on. Yeah. Same as that gum tree. If you look around, yeah. you can see all those trees, leaves. Yeah. One time ago, you could not see through there. Yeah. yeah. Because people were hunting as well, uh -huh. and harvesting food. But now it's all gone away, yeah. because we're not looking after the land. In other words, indigenous people was a gardener to the land. Yeah, you should have a bit of honey on there. If, if, if the native bee was doing it, you'd have honey there. A bit of honey off this yeah. flower. Yeah. But because of the European, that's what's happening. Hmm. So if you walk to this tree here, this tree be dead. Because there's no red meat ants on it, right? Yeah. Those little black ants, they belong to that tree. They live in there. But they do, do not eat honey, whereas the red meat ants, he'll go up this tree looking for honey. And, and, you, and you can see there's nothing there. Even on the flowers, there's no bird or insect on it. Yeah. Like the red meat ants eat sugar, get into sugar bowls, but they will not climb there because they know there's no nectar there. Yeah. Whereas the other tree has, yeah. yeah. Even though this tree is flowering, but you can see that tree is dying as well because you see all the holes in those leaves and the limbs, you know, those little dead branches and that tree behind us, call it mulga tree it's 
the black cockatoo food, food chain. And they eat a lot of this off there. So you don't see any black cockatoos on these trees. No. Yeah. And you can see that they're dying. This one's all right. But the one on that side is dying. And if you look around properly, you'll see a lot of trees are dying. Yeah. They're dying because they're not being pollinated. Yeah. But the indigenous people used to use it for their smooth their boomerang, their spears, sharpen oh, their hook. Yeah. And the more you use this leaf, the bigger the leaf hit and scale you. Okay. And the storm bird, he comes up the river, yeah. living on these. Yeah. They tell you when the storm's coming, and when the storm finish, they go away with the storm. Yeah. So the leaves, they're too small. Yeah, they're too small, and the tree's too small. Like It's uh -huh. an old tree, yeah. but it should be real, very healthy. Take that gum tree for an instance. Mm. A lot of those trees should be really healthy, even though we didn't have much of a wet. But over the years, the, ch the changes you can see, like the fruit, since the indigenous people stopped harvesting, a lot of the fruit is starting to die. My mum used to tell me, to harvest the bush tucker, you must keep harvesting, and if you don't harvest, a lot of the bush tucker will go off. In other words, she used to tell me, Jurwa, and I, it all stuck to my head, because Today I see a lot of that fruit down harvest because we're not doing it properly. Yeah, so I've been living out in Australia for about two and a half years now, but um, I'm from Texas and my family is from Oklahoma. Um, I'm Mississippi Choctaw Chigasaw, it's Native American Indian. Um, Frank's been telling me about the issues that he's seeing with, um, with the land here. He, he's been living on this land for so long. He knows he knows the land. He knows that there's something that's changed. And it's similar to back at home in that my great-great-grandmother was a medicine woman for our tribe. And a lot of the history has been lost. But Frank has so much knowledge to share. And it's great to see that, that someone's out trying to record this information because it is something that's been lost from my tribe. And... Um, it's, yeah, I'm happy to see that it's, well, it's, yeah. Still going. Yeah. Yeah. The fire's been getting out of hand. It's been a lot of burning lately. But the indigenous people, when they burn, they only burn to hunt their food, you know, just late in the afternoon or early hours of the morning when it's cool. And after that, they will not burn. But people now, they seem to burn all the time up in the Northern Territory, constantly burning. And that's not good. But you need to burn in the cool. Yeah. So Frank, when was um, this area burnt? burnt? Yeah. In April, third week of April. Yeah. But if you look at how this was burnt, you can tell there's nothing being burnt, like all the trees, mm. much. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of feed here. If the cattle was in the paddock, there'd be cattle on this burnt feed. Yep. Yeah. 
So just in a few weeks, it's grown green grass again. And yeah. So then the cat, you do an early burn when it's still cool and moist. Yeah, and it prevents that hot fire coming through. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't burn any animal much or any wildlife much. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you look into the distance there and you can see it's quite yeah. green. Yeah, that's what we call patch burning. Yeah, and it's better to do it with horses if you're on a horse, because oh, yeah. you know where to burn and what to burn, yeah. and what. That's why they had old fellas they call boundary riders or fences. They used to go out. Their job was to burn the country, yeah. and they'd burn certain places. Yeah, mm -hmm. where cattle come on, and it's places like this they burn it, yeah. so cattle can come onto. Yeah. People need to understand. There is people out there, such as the indigenous people. I don't know if there's too many left, I don't know, I don't think there is. You know, that understand the land as much as I do. And if there is, you need to listen to them, yeah. And I think the government need to put more money into that sort of stuff, yeah. So something must, you know, has to give somewhere. Something has to go, yeah. We can't keep doing what we do. Yeah. In an indigenous way, you have to give back to the land. And if you're not giving back to the land, you won't get nothing back. Yeah. And we're taking too much out of the land. Yeah. Science cannot beat nature. And the indigenous people that are left, that's where science need to listen to. Otherwise, it's all gone. There's no point in listening to it too late. Like with this bee problem, I was lucky enough to see that and to see the changes in what's going on. The whole earth, the whole atmosphere of the earth itself, it's a garden and we as human beings was put here to look after it, not to destroy it. And I see that because too much development, progress. I don't know. It's just getting worse and we're just rushing to try and make the dollar with a cent.